Greetings, it is I, Tantus Narvan Jacobin, Lord Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue our discussion on AD&D Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. We were, of course, diving into the combat section, getting really in-depth about the combat that you're going to have to know about, both as a game, a dungeon master, and, of course, a player. So let's continue where we left off, parrying. Now, parrying is an optional rule, technically. Now, it's assumed in the course of a combat round, because it is about a minute. You're going to be blocking some attacks in the course of it. The thing is, it makes the assumption that you're never going to drop your guard. It's not really built into the rules for you to be able to do that. Dropping your guard would imply that you're not adding your dex bonus, whatever it would be, to your AC, meaning you're kind of like leaving yourself a little bit more open. You're not trying to dodge out of the way of attacks. It doesn't ever assume for that. What you can do is you can choose to try to defend yourself more. You can choose tied to not take any actions on your turn. No attacks, no spell casting, no movement, nothing. And in turn, you receive a bonus to your AC equivalent to half whatever your character level is. Now, this is a little different from a warrior because they would get half plus one. So assuming if you're a six-level character that's not a warrior, you would subtract three from your AC, increasing it by that very much because you're choosing just to effectively defend yourself and parry against varying kind of attacks. Now, this doesn't work on any kind of attack from your rear, does not work on missile combats, and it doesn't work on special attacks like magical-based attacks that might be coming at you. This is just for your standard melee-based attacks. Now let's talk about missiles in combat, because missile attacks are another major important kind of attack that's going to happen. There are two types of missile combat. The first is direct missile combat. That's assuming something like a sling or bow and arrow, direct attacks that you're making against someone else. The other category is indirect or kind of splash weapons, thrown weapons, things that you chuck at someone and try to indirectly affect them. But let's dive into the direct ones even more. Now, direct ones do have a couple of factors relating to it. First off is, of course, range. Now, every weapon has a short, medium, and long range. Short range assumes that it's up to this number, whatever it's called at short range. You would receive no penalty for making these attacks. Beyond short range, as soon as you've exceeded that number, but before you reach the medium range number, you are within, of course, medium range. Medium range tells you the upper end of the medium range. During that time, if I should make an attack roll, and if it's at that range, I've received minus two to my attack roll. Now, beyond medium range and all the way up to what's called the long range is, of course, long range. At that point in time, as soon as I've passed medium, but before I hit that maximum of the long range, I'm within long range, and I receive minus five to any attack rolls. Beyond the long range, I can't attack that far. It's out of my range, effectively. It's beyond the reach of my weapons and able to shoot that far. Now, most of these types of weapons will have a rate of fire, whether it's being able to throw three daggers in a turn or shoot two arrows from a bow. It will define it as multiple attacks. You will treat this the same as any other multiple attacks that you might have in the course of a round meaning you'd get one off at your normal initiative and then, of course, fill in the rest of them at the end of the turn after everyone's acted. Now, there is some exceptions to this. There are those that have a rate that require them to reload that takes longer than a round, that it might be every other round you can fire. That's actually another type of rate of fire. It just means it's slower, of course. Now, the, there are major defenses you can use against missile combat, in particular, Cover. Cover is the most important defense you're going to be using in a melee combat, and it comes in two types. The first type of cover is called concealment, really, and is referred to as soft cover. It means that it is something that's only kind of blocking your way, kind of physically. It, it would mean that an attack could theoretically pass through this cover when trying to get to you. That it's not technically blocking it, it's physically blocking it. Now, the other type, of course, is whatever would be just referred to as actual cover or hard cover. This would be something like a wall or a tree, something physically that would block an attack. Now, each of these types of cover has a penalty that it gives to the enemy's attacks equivalent to how much percentage of your body it covers. The greater percentage of body that this cover gives, whether it's soft or hard cover, the more of a penalty it gives to the attacks used against you. Now, there are advantages to cover, but it only applies really to missile combat. When it comes into melee, it goes both ways, so it's not really very helpful because not only am I defended, my opponent is defended. Missile combat, on the other hand, it gives you that you're much less of a target to be able to hit. So it is much more advantageous to, of course, use this in missile combat. Now, you can fire a missile attack into melee. It is, unfortunately, it's going to happen more often than not that you're going to have to try to hit an enemy. 
Now the thing is, when you're doing this, it's kind of random which target you're actually going to hit in amongst them. You would take account of all the creatures that are involved in this melee combat, and then you would add some numbers together, where a medium creature is equivalent to one, larger creatures are equivalent to larger numbers, and smaller creatures are different, equivalent to uh, fractions of this amount. Once you have the total number, you sort of round up, and then you would effectively roll. You'd roll kind of randomly and see which of the targets you'd actually hit, assigning numbers based on them. And then your DM will tell you, well, to make your attack roll, actually, once they've determined who you're attacking, and then regardless of where you hit or not, they will inform you who you have hit. If you miss, it doesn't matter, you've just fired into it. If you hit something, they will tell you, oh, you hit your friend, really, or, oh, you hit that guy, not that guy. Things like that, that's occurring, because you're just sort of firing in there and hoping for the best, almost, it seems. So it's useful, but dangerous. Now, returning to cover very briefly, because, as I said, this is actually a form of cover that you have people in melee combat. Cover, when we are talking about it before, it actually does add to saves against direct magical-based attacks. Spells like Fireball or Lightning Bolt, things like that that you'd have a save against. The cover, the same penalty that you'd be adding to the attack of your opponents, you add to as a bonus to your saves. The more cover you have, the more bonus you have. And if you happen to have that 90% cover, you automatically, should you fail, take half damage. Should you succeed, you take no damage from such things. Because you're such covered up, it doesn't take you a lot to get out of the way of something like a fireball, but it has to be blocking your way effectively. Now let's talk about the more indirect attacks and effectively kind of thrown and splash weapons. Traditionally, most of these have a 30-foot range at maximum range, at their long range, and it would be 20 medium, 10 short. Of course, depending on the size, the shape, and how heavy an object is, your DM could change these numbers, kind of give you that, okay, it's much heavier, it has much less of a range, it's much harder to throw at this distance. Most things break upon contact. It will be up to your DM, again, to determine if the item you're throwing would indeed break on contact. Most of these things are meant to kind of hit, splash out some kind of material over an area. Once you're throwing it and you sort of have it on target, you roll a d4 to kind of determine if it's got a little bit of spread at the end and kind of a directionality. This matters a lot more when it comes to actually missing, which the directionality spreads a lot farther. If you're doing the short range, you're dropping off a d6, medium a d10, and long range 2d10. So it can go really far off. Now it's important to note here that you do not need to make an attack roll at that short range because you're so close to it. So as long as you're at short range, you don't actually have to make an attack roll. It's beyond there that you start making an attack roll. It's kind of similar when we were talking about the direct things, that there are in fact weapons that can't make attack rolls at short range, so you're automatically getting a penalty. So it's kind of the opposite of that, That's the, that there's this little like adva advantageous n nature to the short range here, when you can get kind of screwed over a little bit on the direct ones. Granted, that's a certain type of weapon. Once one of these things hits, it has, of course, a, effect, a direct hit effect, which you would figure out if it would hit the target directly, what kind of effect it would. And then it would have a three-foot spread from there that goes out from that area of direct hit, and you can see what kind of area effect it has, a splash area, if you will. Four common items that are used as splash weapons are defined in the book and told you what, how they kind of function on what they would do on a direct hit and what splash would do to them. Now, another type of indirect one that you can use is, of course, a boulder. It's technically indirect. When you're chucking a boulder, you're treating it like a splash weapon. Of course, it's more like giants that are usually going to be using boulders, but of course, they have a similar effect. They are excellent against areas of creatures that are kind of squished together and hitting multiple targets, in fact. You would treat it like the normal sort of arch and figuring out where it's exactly hitting, but boulders have a bounce. They kind of roll and bounce in a certain direction, kind of going out in the direction that you've been throwing it. You would roll 3d10 to determine the exact kind of line out from that spot that they are kind of bouncing and rolling from there. Anywhere, including the directly where they hit and anywhere along the line, they can possibly hit it target. They would make attack rolls against anything that they would hit in that area. Now granted, the farther they get after the bounce, then it actually becomes harder and harder. Every 10 feet you move from there, you get minus 2 to the hit, and the amount of bounce traditionally is a maximum of 3d 10 feet that you'd go from there. So really, 30 feet is the farthest you would go at minus 6 to hit a target at 30 feet, but it would kind of roll down that thing. Now, under certain circumstances, they really can't miss. When it's assuming that you're like in a packed phalanx when they're trying to hit a lot of targets, 
or if it's something more like a hallway where you can't get out of the way, you're going to be assumed to be hit by this entire rolling. Granted, depending on where they're throwing it to depends on where this entire starting position comes in and then followed by the roll, but it might make a difference. Now, though there is an advantage to getting hit by the rolling boulder rather than direct hit, the farther you go, the less damage it actually deals. For every foot of movement it travels after its initial sort of hit and it starts that kind of bounce, it actually subtracts one damage per foot. So let's say you had that maximum of 30 feet it would go. It'd be 30 less damage at the end there. So that does make it minus six to hit, 30 less damage. You're not nearly, nearly doing as much with the boulder at that point in time. It's still rolling through and possibly hitting that person, but they might be able to withstand it very well. So that's it for today. I introduced you to the concept of parrying, a possible optional thing you can do in combat, and talked about missile combat, including the direct combat type of missiles where you're using things like slings and arrows, and indirect where you're throwing things like a flask of oil, a flask of acid, or perhaps something even like a boulder, which would technically be an indirect attack. In the next episode, I'm going to start talking about special attacks and special defenses, which are important to more monster-based characters when you're, or creatures that you might be encountering when it comes to combat. So any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe to support the channel, the empire, and the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon, linked in the description below. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.